Few supporting characters appear more in Batman stories than Alfred Pennyworth. Across comics, TV shows, movies, and more, Alfred always stands by Batman's side. You probably know him as the loyal, skilled, and caring father figure that shaped Bruce into who he would become. But few know the story behind his creation. On this episode of Bat Lessons, we uncover his early history in comics and newspaper strips. And then we discover the surprising way that Alfred is inspired by the same source material as Archer, The Lion King, Clue, 007, John Wick, Black Butler, and more. You don't want to miss it. Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman history podcast. I'm Alex. And I'm Brian. And today we're talking about the foreman of stately Wayne Manor, Batman's beneficent butler, Alfred. Are you excited? I'm super stoked. Uh, I loved all the alliteration there. It's like a regular Harry Potter book. (laughs) But yeah, I've been waiting for this Alfred episode for a while because, I mean, he's the dude. He's the man. There's like nothing bad you can say about Alfred. Yeah. Yeah. One of my I favorite hope. characters, for sure. I don't know where he ranks for you in the pantheon of, of Batman characters. Oh, gosh. He's got to be like top five or something. Like, he's yeah. he's just always there, and he's always awesome. Do you have a favorite, Alfred? And and why is it Michael Caine? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do like Michael Caine a lot. Yeah. But it would be hard to it would be hard to choose between Michael Caine and the the dude who did all of the movies before him. I don't even know that guy's name. Oh, did he do all of them? Did he do uh, like George Clooney yeah. and uh, yes. Val Kilmer and Wow? Yeah, yeah, he was all four of those movies. Yeah, the same thing with Commissioner Gordon. I think it's the same actor for Commissioner Gordon across those four movies as well. But any anyway, like yeah, that guy is very cool. They're different. They're hard to compare. They both had that like loving fatherly figure that challenged Bruce Wayne in in like a really good way. I'm really I'm really curious to see what they do with Andy Serkis. I doubt he'll become my favorite, but like I really liked the type of Alfred that he was in the Batman. Yeah, it was a different take for sure, but I I liked the mm. the dynamic that he had with with Bruce. Michael yeah. Goff. Michael Goff. I thought it was a Michael. Michael Goff. I, I didn't want to get I, the first thought for me was Michael Gambon. I was like, that's not right at all. You're right. He was in uh, Batman, Batman Returns, Batman Forever, and Batman and Robin. I had no idea. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. He's the only. He's like one of the only things that that ties those together. I guess. Yeah. So I thought I thought we would talk a little bit about history of Alfred first because it, it colors the stories we talk about with Alfred a little bit. The the most interesting bit is that we really don't know who created Alfred. Or why? That's because Alfred has several first appearances that all happen at basically the same time throughout the course of 1943. Oh, interesting. So the first time he he goes to customers, like the first time a uh, random Joe on the street can read about Alfred is in Batman number 16, which comes out uh, in April of 1943, has a cover date of May 1943. So he's first, kind of. There was the Batman serial, which is, is the sort of like movie series, which I promise. Our next episode is going to be about. I've I've got okay. notes mostly written. We're coming for it. Oh, great! <laughs> I'm just having a laugh because I know that right after this, I'm going to Iowa to visit my family, yeah. which means I'm probably going to watch the Batman serials with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just very funny to think about because I know a lot of the content in that. Well, we so. can, we could rearrange the recording if we need to. It's, <laughs> no, it's no, it's good. You. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. It'll be an adventure. <laughs> yeah. So that Batman serial, <laughs> the first episode of it, comes out on July 16th of 1943. So that's several months later, right? That's that's mm-hmm. like two months later, three months later. Yeah. Um, and then finally, at the end of that year, October 27th, 1943, we have the third day of the daily newspaper strip. Alfred appears in that, mm. right? We haven't talked about the newspaper strip before. We're talking about it today. That's happening Heck, yes. today. I love it. There is some reason to believe that he actually doesn't originate originate in the comics, that he's that he's not created for the comics. And the reason is mm. that we think he might be created for the serials. There is a shooting script that is on the oh. internet for the Batman serial that's dated February 1943 that includes the character Alfred. And that is the first written record we have of the character. I'll, I'll put a link in the in the show notes. It's on our archive.org. You can you can see a, a, you know a scan. It's of the first seven chapters of the serial. I did get a glimpse at it. It's pretty cool. It's like a time capsule. It is really neat. So yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. We don't really know. It's kind of like the first example of like co-branding, of like c- cross medium, y- you know, synergy. Like yeah. c- very clearly someone decided 
hey, we need this Alfred character, probably for the movie. And they were like, well, let's do it everywhere, right? And because they're different right. creative teams. They're different people that are starting to work mm-hmm. on these things. And and they work together to do sort of this like corporate brand image thing. Batman will have this new character and it's Alfred. So so my mind goes toward when I did the, the Origins episode like a yeah. year ago or whatever. And how there were like three big comics that came out in 1989 to essentially coincide with the movie. And it, it's what the, the man who falls, which mm-hmm. establishes his detective skills. Uh, oh gosh, the shaman, which <laughs> establishes some of the, the bat and the Korea, the sickness right. that he overcame. And then I don't recall what the third one was, but it's the one where he... I I, th- I think year one starts when he returns, but this one was about when he went to Korea and he learned how to be a ninja or not, yes, yes, not yes. a ninja, but martial arts. And those all had overlapping storylines and they referenced each other, <laughs> but they <laughs> were s- separate issues or, or books. Um, and right. so it's like Legends of the Dark Knight and Detective and, you know, they're all right. they're all kind of tying into. Yeah. So so it is really cool to see, like, even in these early days, they were starting to see like, oh, we're we're going to have different media streams for this thing. And we need to have like a cohesive story across them. Yeah. And we need to make sure these writers are talking to each other so that we don't ruin Batman in one place that ends up like being the dominoes that ruins them all. So that's that's really cool. It's it is cool, but like it's interesting. It's one of the things that actually a lot of people have strong opinions about that they I'm wish sure. they wouldn't do. So like, mm. um, for example, Spider Man in the '60s, all mm-hmm. the way up until the early 2000s, has mechanical web shooters. Right? He has the ones oh, that he builds right. himself. Okay. He does yeah. science, right? Yeah. And for the Sam Raimi, Raimi Spider Man movie, I don't know how in depth to go here. Sam Raimi Spider Man movie, he has um, organic web shooters. Right? Like he's mm-hmm. because he's been bitten by the spider. One of the mutations that he gets is that he has organic webbing. Right? That he can shoot the comics at the time feel the need to retcon so it matches so they make the comic books match the movies and people get upset right because they're they're saying the tail's wagging the dog right this is that's supposed to be the adaptation this is the original why are we why are we changing our stuff and it happens all the time where comic books are are rearranging themselves to match the movies but turns out all the way 1943 probably happening then too Interesting. The example you just gave doesn't sound like synergy to me. That sounds mm. like the tail wagging the dog. Like sure. they <laughs> followed suit, right? Yeah. Um, so that that is interesting. Tr- strong case to be made for that too, because um, certainly the organic web shooters was not. I can't remember who the screenwriter for the Sam Raimi Spider Man eventually would be, but the first time the organic web shooters show up are actually in a 1993 treatment for a Spider-Man movie written by none other than James Cameron. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. No kidding. James Cameron. Yes. He wrote a wow. treatment for Spider-Man in 1993. And there's a lot of elements, not a lot, maybe like 10% of the Sam Raimi movie comes from the James Cameron treatment because the, there's continuity of production all the way that almost 10 years where wow. there's a little bits and pieces that, that stick around. Man, that guy's touched a lot of things. The whole thing's out there online. You can read it. Okay. I had no idea. Don't recommend it. <laughs> So yeah, choose your own adventure. Do you do you want to do the newspaper strips or do you want to do Batman number 16 first? Which Alfred appearance do you want to talk about? Let's do the newspaper strips. What so what do you know about newspaper comics? So when I was little, yeah, in the morning, we would eat cereal and I would read the comics before I would go to school um, almost every day for several years. Yeah. So I I know those comics well and i also remember i owned a bunch of the garfield books that were (laughs) like they were wide and and long or whatever you describe that um because they would be like one or two of those strips on each page they're really short it's like you gotta set up and knock down your punchline in in about three panels so you got the gist but for the for the for the benefit of our audience it used (laughs) to be (laughs) Before there was the web, right? Or before there was Twitter or before there was Facebook, mm-hmm. right? Or mm-hmm. even before there was like cable television, right? The way people got their news was on dead trees. Yeah. There's sort of like the the post-war suburban version of the newspaper where like white picket fence, single family home, paper boy or girl riding their bicycle. They throw a paper to you every day. There's also the version that's probably closer to what was happening in the 40s when this is taking place, which is, you know, you're going to work every day before you get on the bus, before you get on the train, you walk by a newspaper stand and you pick up a paper to read on the bus Mm -hmm. or train on your way to work or on the way home, right? You grab one to read on the couch. No television really in homes yet, right? You have, maybe you go to the theater for some movies. Um, You've got radio, Radio, right? But like 
newspaper is a major mass mass media, right? No internet, no phones. Oh yeah. Well, and like the the number one sense for people is sight. So seeing things sure. is is really big. Like I had this interesting comparison when I was learning about dog training, where they were like, yeah, when you go on a walk, your dog loves it because they're smelling all this these different things, and it's almost like you sitting and watching a movie. You mm -hmm. don't have to go anywhere, but it's just like it fills your mind with all. It the like washes you're over you. Yeah. Yeah, and and so yeah, I I that totally makes sense that sitting at home and listening to a radio would be like cool and interesting, but like I would be too fidgety. <laughs> and it, whereas like looking and seeing something with my eyes would settle me down in a different way because the sense is more stronger. And it's it, it's subsidized, right? It's subsidized by advertisement. Um, oh, of it's course, very yeah. cheap, right? Capitalism. <laughs> yeah, there's not even a, a distribution cost, really, right? Because you're going yeah. and getting it. So, you know, mm -hmm. very, very cheap. It's something that's affordable, even for people who potentially don't can't afford to have a radio. So yeah, the the Batman newspaper comic strip starts in October of 1940s. There's one other thing I, yeah. I did want to say on that. Uh, so t to the same points you're making, it, it is a visual medium, but because of the way that uh, newspapers are, it's super short form because yeah. you would have like a page full of these things. So like instead of watching a movie, now you could watch like an Instagram reel. Sure. It's like yeah. it's a very short form yeah. of the same concept. It's the same thing as what we're talking about here is you could read a novel mm -hmm. uh, or you could read a big like Batman issue, multiple pages or sure. in the newspaper, your very short form, like single line, three to four panels. Yeah. In, in the daily strips, it is a single line of cells, four to five cells usually actually for Batman. Yeah. Although there were different formats, so so different comics may may have had different things. You know, they're they're single panel, family circus style things, things like that. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that would run Monday through Saturday. Those daily strips are black and white, mm -hmm. um, and and they started in October of 1943 for for Batman. On Sunday, the comic is in color because the newspaper is in color. That format is much closer to that of a normal comic page, right? So the Batman yeah, Sunday strips are like 12 panels laid out across like four rows. Um, so it's like a single page of a comic book. In in the case of both, right, the story is continuous, uh, but they don't cross over. So, for example, the daily strip every single day is picking up where the last day left off. But in the case of the Sunday stri strip, you're picking up where the last Sunday strip left off. And the reason for that is because not every paper is going to carry both. So you might be reading, you know, the New York Times and they do the dailies Monday through Saturday. But Sunday, there's no Batman. Or you might be reading like, I don't know. The Daily Mail, <laughs> you know, some, some other newspaper mm -hmm. and they don't have the Daily Strip, but they've got the Sunday Strip. They could be carrying both, but they may not. It's really be. interesting. So that makes me wonder if this this was like a Bob Kane financing thing mm -mm. to say, let's get in multiple newspapers. That way people buy from more newspapers and then Batman <laughs> gets more kickbacks. Yeah, because if you if like you could do the New York Times Monday through Friday and then like Saturday and Sunday to get Batman, you have to do the New York Post or something. I, I don't know. I, I get this. Uh, that's very possible. I get the sense that Bob Kane, for the record, is like uh, very much in love with the idea of, of doing a newspaper strip. At the time, comic books are less prestigious, more mm -hmm. disposable, um, less well regarded. Right. Because comic books are pretty new. Right. They've not been going on that long. Newspapers and comic strips and newspapers go back decades. Right. So for him, he grew up reading them. They have a much larger distribution. People are buying newspapers because they want the news and they're getting the comic strip. People who are buying comic books want comic books. Right. So like it's for adults. It's for families. It's for kids as well versus a comic book, which is only for kids. So Bob Kane was very, very enamored with the idea of doing comic strip. He's very excited about it. He essentially, in 1943, when he starts working on the newspaper strip, completely stops working on the comic books, right? He, he totally switches over because he thinks it's a, a bigger deal. That being said, cool. I think from a business perspective, he's not really in control. So at this point, uh, he's contracting with DC and DC is working with the, the syndicate. And so the syndicate is the company that's selling the strip to various publishers. The, the sense I got when I was reading about history of this is that they might choose to carry the strip or not literally based on like whether they have space like a lot of times when they're building their comic book page or their comic strip page they're deciding like okay i have something that's like three inches wide by two inches tall what can slot right and they're literally choosing stuff based on format based on price based on audience right so why one might have the dailies and not the sundays or or, or vice versa i don't i don't i don't really know but uh for the record this this arrangement that they have where there's three actors, right? There's Bob Kane and his shop. There's mm -hmm. DC and there's the syndicate. It's very unusual. Normally, newspaper strips were contracted directly between the newspaper syndicate and a writer artist. So Batman is more corporate 
right? There is more middlemen. There is, it, it is something that's like a brand that is, is selling it. It's not sort of an auteur. And the, the person who's sort of driving the, the boat here is an editor named Jack Schiff, right? So he does the work of, of sort of shepherding, keeping things on time, et cetera. Bob Kane uh, and his shop are delivering things that like need inking or need lettering or, and all that stuff's happening in the bullpen at DC, which is, which is kind of odd. So according to Bob Kane, he primarily penciled the dailies, but did not work on the Sunday strips. Quote, I couldn't do both. It would have taken me too much time. You can't do Sundays and dailies. It becomes impossible. You know, as always with Bob Kane, we have to take everything he said with a grain of salt. It's very likely that he had ghosts uh, throughout the run and wasn't doing as much drawing as he'd lead you to believe. However, I will say we're going to read the first six days here in a second. And it is a little bit more of a cartoony style. It's a little bit sillier. It's a little bit more of what you would expect from a comedy that comes in a, in a newspaper strip. And my understanding, according to Jerry Robinson and other people who are on the record, that is actually where Bob Kane's skills lie, right? Mm. He had previously done inking for like Betty Boop, as an example, at Fleischer oh, Studios. Okay. And so mm -hmm. this is more in his wheelhouse, more up his, his alley. You know, there's less ink spilled. Like, not a lot of people have written historical documents. There's not as many books. There's not as many articles. People aren't as interested in the newspaper strips. So people haven't done that sort of in-depth research. But I kind of believe that Bob Kane was doing more penciling here. And the, the the newspaper strip doesn't go on that long. It's it's done by like 1946, right? So it's only active for like three years. So if he is doing the penciling, which I think it's pretty likely he's doing some, this is probably the last time he ever does any penciling. But but from then on, he's coasting. He's not really interesting. doing any work. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, because we, we know he doesn't come back to the comic books. Right. Basically, 1943, he's out for good. They're just putting his name on it. One other artist that I do want to talk to talk about besides Bob Kane is a guy named Charles Paris. He's most famous for having worked on the daily newspaper strip. Jerry Robinson turned down this job of inking the newspaper strip because he wanted to stay on the comic books. But Charles Paris takes him up. Uh, he inked every single daily strip and every single Sunday strip that was ever released. And he went from being paid $45 a week to work on the comic books up to $85 a week to be working on the wow. comic strip. Yeah. That's pretty legit. Yeah. He was making a lot more. And by yeah. moving from the books to the strips, he was also no longer required to work in the bullpen. So he starts working from home a lot more instead. And I get the vibe that he's kind of like living the life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he says, quote, I had a horse out on Long Island. I worked half days. Had a horse? Days a yeah, I had a horse on Long Island. <laughs> I worked four half days a week. And the rest of the time I spent on horseback, except on Mondays. Then I gave the horse the day off. I could ink two dailies in the morning and go horseback riding in the afternoon. Now that's the God's truth. I loved it. Inking that newspaper strip was the easiest job I ever had in my entire life. Oh my God. I can't even imagine. <laughs> Four half days. <laughs> oh my gosh. Doesn't that sound that's like a, a great job? That sounds like a great job. And he's getting paid double what he was before. Yes, about. he is. God. That's amazing. And this is the job Jerry Robinson turned down. <laughs> wow. Well, congrats to what Charles Paris. Congrats yes. to him. That's he's, awesome. He's living the life. Yeah. Too bad it only lasted, what, three years? Three years. And, yeah. Yeah. After the strip ends in That's 1946, amazing. he continues to ink Batman um, in the comic books. He would do so all the way until 1965, making for a 22-year-long run inking for the character, which is probably one of the longest to ever work on Batman. Wow. That's impressive. Uh, who who was the dude we talked about who who inked and he changed technologies? He worked for like eighty years or something. George Rousseau. George Rousseau. Got it. He's been yeah. inking and doing backgrounds. So Jerry Robinson I made a great joke in that episode yes. that no one could hear in the recording. What was it? <laughs> so I said I blame the inker. Like we made some some comment. Like we talked about inking and how it was like important, but people are downplaying it. And and then there was a uh, I don't remember the specifics, but something changed that people weren't happy about. And I said, I blame the inker. <laughs> so yeah, George Rousseau has, has been inking and doing backgrounds on basically all the issues we've been reading, including I think Batman 16, which we'll read tonight. But it, it's not to say that Charles Paris had one of the longest careers in the industry. That's not the case. It's longest with one character. Oh, George Rousseau would move on to other characters. Jerry okay. Robinson also moves on to other characters, right? Mm -hmm. But Charles Paris exclusively with Batman for 22 years. That's awesome. So what we're going to read from the newspaper strip today is, is one of the three intros of Alfred. It's written by Bill Finger and drawn by Bob Kane, maybe? <laughs> it's just the first six days. And the deal is, with these f first six strips, uh, they were meant to always come first. So every single newspaper that carried Batman, if, like, if, if a newspaper started, like picked up Batman a year in, 
right? They're, they're, they've already been serializing. They start, no matter what, they're going to start with these six strips. They're going to do these first, and then they'll, they'll jump to whatever the current continuity is. They're not going to throw people in cold. This is the sort of intro to Batman. So that's the context is that the, this is for someone who doesn't know who the character is. These six days are supposed to tell you everything you need to, need to know. Strip number one, panel one, that first image. Do you have any thoughts about that image? Uh, trick question. I mean, it's banned on the run by the wings, right? <laughs> just, just like 30 years early. <laughs> you know, it does look familiar. This is not original art. This first panel is the cover to Batman number nine, which we've done on the show before. It's oh, okay. not only the cover to Batman number nine. It is also the cover, but mirrored to Batman number 16, which we're reading on today's <laughs> episode of the show. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So for whatever reason, the DC editorial, they love this picture. They think this is like the Batman picture. If you go on eBay and you search like Batman 1943, which is the movie serial, right? You will find that like, I don't know how long ago it was, like five years ago, 10 years ago, they did a statue of Batman out of like bronze that you could buy. It's like, I don't know, 16th scale or something like that, where he's doing this pose from from the cover no of Batman kidding. number nine. Yes. So this is a pretty iconic, important piece of Batman art, apparently. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is this. It, it is it, that. <laughs> it, it, came with, it came in a box with this art on it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Huh. Robin kind of conveniently cut out of the statue. <laughs> yes, I am noticing that as well. It's a four inch sculpture. Yeah. And it's going for about 40 bucks. So yeah, October 25th, 1943. The title of this strip is called Sentinels of the Law. If you take out that first panel, which is the cover of Batman number nine, says, who are they? We've really only got three panels of art because there's two mm -hmm. with just words. Mm -hmm. We've got Bruce in like, I don't know, a, a cloak, a gown. What do you call that? What he's wearing? A robe. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. A lounging a robe. house robe. Yes. Yeah. And his night chair, he's on the telephone, lounging, leaning back. You get the sense that he's very wealthy. Roaring fire next to him. I, I do. I do think it's funny because it's like it's very 1943, right? Like the, the style of everything we're seeing is like of the time. Yeah. And it has been for all the issues we've talked about. But I can't I, I will say when you sent these over to me and I read them to my family, I read them with that like 1940s like uh announcer voice Be yeah. and you start at the very top like batman and robin sentinels of the law <laughs> <laughs> who are they it feels that way and he's talking on the phone so with someone he's like oh i'm so i'm too tired to attend the dance the weather you know he's he's playing off like he's uh yeah i know exactly the weather makes me tired too <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make a ton of sense does it yeah <laughs> oh you know the weather <laughs> and then uh we cut to the young ward uh, Dick Grayson, who's presumably in a chair next to him reading a history book. The book is literally yeah. says history. Gosh, Bruce almost has me fooled that, that with that act of his. And it says, for that indolent attitude only serves as a disguise for the that, that nemesis of crime who, with his daring young aide, forms the dynamic team of Batman and Robin. Yeah, and it's we've got Batman and Robin swinging in uh, in front of the moon. In a, on a city street to kick mm -hmm. some goons who are, looks like maybe they're holding up a jewelry store mm -hmm. and they're the ones yelling out Batman and Robin, you know, they're in shock. We've, we've scared. Oh criminals. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the, look, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's, <laughs> pe people on the street going Batman and Robin. <laughs> yeah. And that's, if you don't know anything about Batman on October 25th, 1943, you, you, your newspaper strip, this is all you get. Rich guy. Spoiler city. Has a ward, Batman and Robin. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's got it's got that little bumper at the end. Watch for the thrilling adventures of Batman and Robin. Tomorrow, trained crime fighters. Indeed, uh, October 26, 1943, trained crime fighters. Mm -hmm. um, this is we're we're montaging, right? We want we're learning more about about them. There's a the smoking gun. We learned that both of their parents were taken by senseless gun violence. Mm -hmm. They're training, boxing, wrestling. They're they're doing that classic gymnastics moves acrobatics so, yeah acrobatics yes and then it jumps to them in their laboratory working yes. on uh, the science of crime yes men of, of of high technology and science we don't have computers mm -hmm. right they're mm -hmm. they're doing some sort of a uh, chemist uh, work yep just a cool shot of, of batman in front of the moon but you do notice or at least i noticed that in the first panel or the first uh, strip it starts with the title of like Mm -hmm. This is what Batman and Robin look like. Who are they? Like it, it looks like the cover of something. Whereas Tuesday's strip doesn't have that. It just says Batman and Robin up in the corner. Mm -hmm. And then it jumps straight into 
the explanation of what it's doing for that strip. Yeah, you've got so little space. You don't have room for mm -hmm. a title card. You don't have room for a cover. They That's only right. do that once. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Strip number three, October 27th, 1943, Wednesday. We've got the introduction of Alfred. Meet another member of the Wayne household. Alfred, perfect butler. He's serving them dinner. Dick says, mm -hmm. swell dinner, Alfred. Expert chauffeur. It's got Alfred essentially, I don't know, chewing out some other driver on the road that isn't doing well. Well, <laughs> I get the sense that Alfred's not doing particularly well. <laughs> We've got motion lines next to his head like he's jerking the steering wheel, you know? And uh, it looks like Dick Grayson saying, Roadhog, Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> I read it the, the opposite way, that this other guy was not driving well and Alfred was veering out of the way. <laughs> We've definitely had a near miss. Yes, definitely, yeah. The blighter. <laughs> and then um, amateur detective. We've got Alfred here. He's reading a book. What book is he reading? Uh, how to be a detective. How to be a detective. Remember that. Put that in your mind, palace. <laughs> You know, just some lines about how he's devoted to Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson. He's the only living person that knows his secret identities. They're running off in their costumes. And he says, good hunting, sir. Watch for the thrilling adventures of Batman and Robin starting soon. <laughs> uh, I did notice in this strip yeah. that with that comment of like, ah, oh, the blighter, why doesn't he watch where mm -mm. he's going? They have immediately established in the second panel yeah. that Alfred shows up as he's some sort of British background. Oh, 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 first panel. So... Yeah, you're yeah. right. I, as I was saying it, I was reading how he said Master Dick. Yeah, so, so yeah. Dick says, swell dinner, Alfred. And he goes, thank you, Master Dick. M-A-W-S-T-E-R. Yes. Yeah, if, if this was your first introduction to Alfred, what would you think? Do you like this character? He's a butler. Yeah, you don't know much about him. He's, he's a butler. Yeah, he's a butler. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Rich guy is a butler. Shocked. The fourth strip, we get introduced to Gordon. We get yep. to sit, uh, They tell us that Bruce and Dick are friends with Gordon. Uh, outside mm -hmm. of being Batman. And we also see the bat signal. Gordon's running up to the roof and Batman and Robin are there in their costumes. Yep. And but it, it is introducing the whole police element, I think, because because it's Commissioner Gordon and the bat signal, because that, <laughs> that's like a package deal. I, I do continually find it fascinating how back in the 40s, I guess, someone like Bruce Wayne, it was not a weird thing to just like chill out and Commissioner Gordon oh, in the sure. commissioner's office and be like, hey, tell me, what are the crimes going on right now? <laughs> it's like, I can't even yeah. imagine having that time to just sure. have some rando come chill in my office and chat me up. Yeah, it's wild. Strip number five, we get introduced to the Batcave. We're back at Wayne Manor. Um, you see it's hidden behind a bookshelf. Batman mm -hmm. and Robin are running down the stairs to the Batcave. Alfred says, do be careful, sirs. Don't get hurt. Ah, but but you'll notice they did the alliteration just like at the top of the episode. It said, nobody but their faithful factotum, Alfred. Oh, I should have used that one. I, I wrote my own. So here's, here's the thing about the alliterations. <laughs> I actually, for all of our episodes, have been going to the Batman 66 episodes and cribbing what the narrator said. Oh, nice. Yeah. And for episodes cool. where there is no Batman 66 episode. So for example, Two-Face, I've been going to the Batman 66 comic. <laughs> and recruiting their alliterations because that's something they always <laughs> did on the show. That's part of Batman 66. I that's couldn't great. find one for Alfred, so I wrote my own. I should have come here. Their faith <laughs> faithful factotum, Alfred. That's awesome. And then we just get the coolest diagram of the back. Yeah, a crazy cool diagram that shows there's a uh, there's a barn at Wayne Manor that um, I guess that's where there's a winch that pulls um the bat plane or the batmobile yeah all of the vehicles up and down so you get the <laughs> plane it says bat planes hangar and batmobile's garage are underneath there and then you've got the laboratory and the the study and then there's an elevator that goes up to wayne manor itself could so, you um just for the audience it's yeah. going to seem weird but put this mm -hmm. in your mind palace could you describe mm -hmm. for them batman's study <laughs> okay uh batman's study is what it looks like to me is a massive desk set perfectly center in the room with one of those big are they called wingback chairs mm -hmm. yeah and uh over over the top of where he would sit is a huge bat symbol mm -hmm. and then off to one side you've got a big bookshelf mm -hmm. and off to the other side you've got i don't know what that is like a piano or a, a, a chair or something i think it's a chair i'm not sure and then immediately to the left of where Batman or Bruce Wayne or whoever would be sitting, I read as Dick's chair, which is just oh, like yeah, a, a little a small one chair. <laughs> yeah. 
large cave-like okay. room, bat on the back wall, large wooden desk, wing back chair, perfectly centered. Remember that one for okay. a, a future episode. We will come back. All right. And then finally, strip number six, we get introduced to the vehicles. That's right. The Batmobile and the Batplane. From the underground lair, beneath the home of Bruce Wayne and his young ward, Dick Grayson, sometimes emerges the Batmobile. Fastest thing on four wheels. Yeah. And sometimes the Batman, or the Batplane, which I think this is an interesting adjective. Yeah. Weird craft of the night. <laughs> it kind of looks a little bat-like. It's got some scalloping going on, and it's got yeah. um, a cowl on the front of it. Both the Batplane and the Batcar. I, I do think it's funny that both of them look like totally normal machines overall, mm -hmm. except they just stuck like Batman's mask on the front. Yes. <laughs> right. So it's even the bat car. Plane, it's just a like, car. Yeah. I've seen planes like that bat plane. Sure. Of that time. Yeah. But it has Batman's face on the front. It does. Yes. So that's the six, six day introduction that people get to Batman. What's really interesting to me is we've been talking about all these firsts. Every episode up until now, it's like, oh, is this the first time we're seeing the bat signal? Is this the first time we're seeing the Batmobile? Is this the first mm -hmm. time we're seeing the bat plane? Right? Mm -hmm. October 1943, what's missing, man? It's here. Rich socialite, sidekick, all of the training they've done. You know, mm -hmm. they become scientists, they become boxers, they become acrobatic. Gymnasts. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. gymnasts, acrobatic people. They've they've got um, you know, parents died by gun violence. Mm -hmm. they, they've got Alfred, Bat Signal, Bat Cave. Batplane, Batmobile, mm -hmm. Commissioner Gordon. What's not here, man? The utility belt. It's true. <laughs> Very limited <laughs> space. I just yeah. think, you know, it's fully fully developed for the most part. It's here. Absolutely. And it's concise. They told you everything you need to know. Yeah. I, that, so the reason I said utility belt is, is that the only thing missing was gadgets. Like, that was another thing that Batman was really big on. He doesn't have superpowers. Right. Because he's got all these gadgets. Um, but I don't think that's really worth the, the comic strip. I think rightfully left out, but, but yeah, that is, that is the intro to Batman in a, in a nutshell. Indeed. So do you want to talk about Batman number 16 next? Or do you want to talk a little bit about inspiration for, for Alfred now that we've had him introduced? So I, I think that, uh, I'm really interested in the inspiration. So let's do that last. Let's do it okay. after we read the issue. Sounds good. So Batman number 16 written by Don Cameron. He's the same guy that did the Tweedledee and Tweedledum episode. We did just, oh, nice. just last time. We just did that, yeah. Yes. He's also famous for writing a lot of the newspaper strips, although he didn't write the one we just read. Potentially related to James Cameron? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. And, <laughs> and the art for Batman number 16, Jerry Robinson and, and George Russo. Title page, who do we got here? Is that Sherlock Holmes? Or is that Alfred on how to be a detective? It does. It does look like a a lot like Sherlock Holmes. He's got the what do you call that hat? The deerstalker hat? Yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. Not a clue. He's got a spyglass like he's being a detective. And he's got what book, Brian? Uh, how to become a detective. How to be a detective. <laughs> yeah. So clearly some synergy happening here. Alfred always reading how to become a detective when he's first introduced. So in the story, Alfred is coming to America from overseas. Uh, it's wartime, right? So we know that um, it's a perilous journey, but he's come by a passenger boat and there is uh, a passenger that he's uh, befriended named Mr. Leduc or Leduc, Leduc, Leduc on the boat. And he says, it's been a pleasure and they're checking in at customs and we find out that Mr. Leduc has some sort of special paperwork that means his he doesn't need to go through customs. They don't need to look through his bags or anything like that. And Alfred overhears that while he's going through customs, they're looking through his bags and Alfred says, hmm, there's something weird about that guy. I knew it. So he gets off the boat. We're at the dock. And we have a racist depiction of what I believe Ugh. is supposed to be Hispanic person. They they call oh, them gosh. three swarthy individuals. Yeah. And, what does swarthy mean? Uh, it means dark skinned. Oh, really? It does. I have no yes. idea. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that, that they would be of n not Caucasian, like someone who has like their, their skin is turned to leather, could potentially be called swarthy, but it is uh, a pejorative. Wow. Yes. And so, a little racist. He's got a handlebar mustache. I think they call him Manuel or Manuel. But they've got guns. They are getting ready to try to steal a bag, and they jump out of their car. Batman and Robin are there. They happen to be on the docks while these bad guys, three dudes, jump out of the car, and they run towards none other than Alfred. And they ask for his valis. They want his bag. They're sticking him up. And he's like, dude, I don't have anything, man. So he swings the bag at him, hits him in the face. Batman's like, good for him. 
yeah. they come and help him anyway. I love it. Yep, they shake hands with Alfred, and um, he's like, hey, man, uh, <laughs> he's very presumptuous. Alfred's like, if you ever need my help, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a detective myself. And <laughs> Batman and Robin are like, we'll keep that in mind, buddy. Okay. Yeah, that's that. Alfred walks away. Robin asks why they're not chasing after the guys, and, and Batman's like, they're in a car. We, we could never catch up. Later, they've come back home. We're at Wayne Manor, and Batman and Robin are getting out of their costumes. They're putting on their pajamas, which I think is really <laughs> funny. Robin goes straight out of his costume into his pajamas. And they remark that, that Alfred wasn't a very smart guy. Quote, imagine a dimwit like him finding us when some of the smartest men in the world have tried and failed. Uh-oh, someone's at the door. Ring. <laughs> <laughs> and Batman goes and answers it. And who who's at the door but? Alfred. Alfred's at the door. And they're both freaking out. Like, <laughs> Robin and Batman, they both go, huh? And we see Bruce kind of do like a, a double take. You know, mm -hmm. what's going on? Uh, Alfred's explaining that he had such a hard time getting here. You know, he was on a... <laughs> it sorry, is very ahead. funny, too, because he's like, what a time I had getting here, Mr. Wayne. And and Bruce and, and Dick are like, uh, yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> well, he also explains that on, on the ocean, like he was on a boat and there was another boat that got torpedoed in front of them because like the war's going on and that was really crazy. Dang. But they, they made it okay. And then when he got mm -hmm. into port, these guys jumped him, but Batman and Robin helped him. And like Bruce, at this point, Bruce is realizing, oh, he doesn't know that we're one and the same because he just mentioned Batman and Robin. He doesn't say you guys, right? And so he yeah, tells yeah. Dick to be quiet. Yeah, cause it's funny because Dick here is like, oh, why? Then you didn't know. <laughs> and Bruce is like, shut Quiet. up. <laughs> Quiet, Dick. <laughs> Alfred says, I've always admired Batman as a brother criminologist, you know? But would you believe it? When he asked me to call, I quite forgot to ask his address. <laughs> I was going to help you out, but, you know, I don't actually, I don't know where to find him. So at this point, right, Alfred's just kind of barged in. He's talking about his journey. We have no idea why he's there. Like, he's just showed up at the door. They don't know who he is. Alfred explains that he is the son of uh, the longtime butler for the Wayne family. His father had been a butler for Bruce's father, for Thomas. For Tom, yeah. Right. He, Alfred, didn't want to do it. He had um, taken up uh, singing on the stage. He wanted to be a singer. Yeah. Didn't work out and, and now feels indebted to the family. Must come and be Bruce's butler. Well, but hold on a second. <laughs> He's saying, oh, yeah, I wanted to do this other thing and it didn't work out. And now I feel guilty and I have to come back to you. OK, so it's a little bit more complicated. Bruce says, oh, so you're the son of the good old Jarvis. How is he? Yeah. And Alfred says, gone, sir. And on his deathbed, he made me promise to mend my ways and come to your house in America. So you see, even if you don't want me, there isn't any help for it. Right. So he's he's made a deathbed there we promise. Go. Yeah, his dying father. <laughs> it, it is interesting that. We haven't talked about this yet on the in this episode. Yeah. This guy doesn't look anything like Alfred. No. Pudgy guy. Bald. Yeah. Young. Younger. Yeah. I, I mean, I yeah. Would, I mean, like, we know maybe? Alfred is, like, yeah. white-haired. Yes. This guy is black-haired. Middle-aged, I mean, for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, he's got, yeah, he's got, like, the cold sack. sack. Yeah. But he's, I mean, yeah, late 40s, probably. And and he's also kind of dumb. <laughs> we, get, we get the sense that he's a little dim, right? Like, he's offering yeah. to be... Batman and Robins, you know, help them out with crime fighting. He forgets to ask the address. Yeah, didn't get their address. You know, he's reading a book, How to Be a Detective, fancies himself a detective, right, for yeah. some reason. Which which is kind of ironic, because in the daily strips that we just read, yeah, describes him as a detective, as a, a some kind of criminologist. So, Right. I, I think there's a synergy there where, like, he's he has an interest in being a de detective. But I also got the vibe that very similar to the Daily Strip, they're they're making him out to be a little bit of a dunce, a little bit of a doofus. Because right. he's also reading the How to Be a Detective. He has the near miss in the car, right? They call him a road hog. It's uh, a lot of the same sort of, like, character elements. Yeah. So I guess I guess maybe that was something I didn't catch in the Daily Strips that now I'm understanding is that they weren't describing him as a criminologist. They were describing him as a want to be yes, criminologist. He's, he's yeah, a, an amateur. He's a he's Got a to be. definitely a poser. <laughs> Got it. Dick's like, dude, we can't have this guy nosing around. They're gonna, he's gonna find <laughs> out that we're Batman and Robin. And Bruce is like, you're right. We're gonna we gotta send him packing, but it's late. We'll we'll talk to him about it tomorrow. So they go to bed, and who shows up? at the house at Wayne Manor other than Manuel Manuel and his goons the three guys who jumped Alfred at the port which by the way we still don't know why they wanted the bag right and they say hey we're gonna get that bag again we're gonna get our hands on it and now we know Alfred can't drop a tail oh sure yeah <laughs> followed him to the house he's, he's not yeah. that smart 
Um, I also think it's really interesting that we have like Mediterranean red tile on the on, yeah, on Wayne Manor here, which is like too. so different. <laughs> it doesn't look like Wayne Manor at no. all. It, yeah. A beam of light wakes up Bruce. He's in his bed. He bolts upright and he says, what? Special burglar alarm. Someone has forced open one of the east windows. It's kind of cool. He's got a he's got a silent alarm. Yeah, it looks like a projector kind of at the foot of his bed. Doesn't that figure that a superhero would be like, no, we don't want a loud alarm that scares them away. Let's do a <laughs> silent alarm. I yeah. can take care of this. So then uh, Bruce Wayne jumps into his, his Batman gear and uh, Dick Grayson is like, oh, you're awake. My my burglar alarm went off and I wondered if you knew. But yeah, I guess I see you're on the you're on the job. Alfred, I'm not sure what he's doing. He's going through. So he he's says, got this huge stack of newspapers that he's going through, right? Yeah, he says, Mr. Wayne is a nice person, but a typical bachelor. Look at these newspapers. Weeks old and not yet taken out. <laughs> hmm, this picture. So there's a gigantic, it's like past his waist. Like it's got to be like four foot tall, yeah, five huge. foot tall, something. Yeah. Stack of newspapers. And he picks one up, the to- up off the top and it says, Duke of Dorian, Premier, flees Nazi invasion. And he says, it is he, Gaston Leduc. Remember, Mr. Leduc mm-hmm. is the person he was on the, on the uh, boat with. And he says, no wonder I sent something mysterious about him. I uh, must look him up and let him know I pierced his incognito. He is the Duke of Dorian. So this guy is fleeing the war. He's some sort of like, you know, well-to-do individual. And a moment later, uh, Manuel and his guys come inside. They've got a knife and they're mm-hmm. jumping Alfred. So you thought you escape. You did not think I would follow you, did you? Right. So we definitely get the vibe that like something, maybe something's happened to his bag at this point. That's what I'm inferring mm-hmm. is that like Mr. Mr. Leduc has like hidden something in his bag mm-hmm. or something like that. Uh, and these guys know it somehow. Batman and Robin show up and they start fighting the goons. Robin breaks a hand mirror <laughs> over uh, Manuel's head and they jump out the window. He actually does kind of an impressive thing. He uses this hand mirror like a tennis racket and swats yes. down a knife that's flying through the air. That was pretty impressive. Uh, but yeah, he he smacks this guy in the head. Uh, Robin smacks this dude in the head, and then they go and jump out the window. And Robin says, "I'm going to get the Batmobile." And uh, Batman says, "We're gonna we're gonna follow." Oh, Batman says, "Better tie up this fellow before he comes to." <laughs> and Alfred says, "Oh wait, but sir, about your address." <laughs> yeah, he, he, he wants to, to get to know, you know, where who Batman is, how I can it's help like, you. I know, I know this is an emergency, but I forgot to ask you before. <laughs> Don't you want my amateur uh, detective skills? Yeah. I, I'm a bit of a criminologist <laughs> myself. So instead of tying up the dude like uh, Batman just told him to do, he's going to go check on Batman and Robin. So he runs to their rooms, realizes they're not there. He's like, huh, where'd they go? But before he can do any more investigating, the guy that he didn't tie it up uh, comes to, gets a knife, and comes to to fight him and he's like swinging down to like stab mm-hmm. alfred and alfred's gonna punch back but he misses the punch again kind of bumbling kind of stupid and he punches this shield that's on a on the wall knocks the shield off the wall yeah shield falls off and hits the guy in the head so like he's dispatched the goon on accident yes goons knocked out and as the shield's falling like it moves one of the axes that's on the wall and it opens up the bookcase and all of a sudden uh. the secret passageway He's accidentally set it off. He's found Great the secret, secret button on accident nice. to, to the Batcave. And he's like, huh, what's this? And he goes down these stairs and all of a sudden there's the Batplane. He's like, Bruce and Dick are Batman and Robin. Yeah, this like this little s- section of luck here yeah. makes me expect like Scooby-Doo and Shaggy to come out of <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's very Scooby-Doo for sure. Yeah. But like we're in on the joke. Like we're supposed to think Alfred's a little stupid. He's, sure. he's bumbling in into the solution. And and when he realizes that Bruce Wayne is Batman and Dick is Robin, he's got those like eyes like they're welling up with tears, like the the like very excited cute emoji. <laughs> he puts his little finger on his lips. He goes, yeah, oh, he's like with a little oh, smile. <laughs> my dreams could it's never a... have come more true. Very odd expression for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they chase the guys to a theater because, of course, it has to be a theater. We're going to have our interesting set piece. Mm -hmm. And they're fighting with, like, weights and ropes. Like, Batman and Robin get Uh, tied up in the rafters. Mm -hmm. And they're tied back to back. And then, lo and behold, Alfred shows up. He walks in. He's like, ah, perhaps Batman has been here and gone. And then he's... 
well, he starts to sing or something, right? Yes, because he's he wanted to be a singer. He's be on the actor, stage. Yeah. He goes, so Arr, again, he's a what's doofus. that noise? He's Can a dit. Be another spirit come to <laughs> haunt me, right? Because Batman and Robin are bound and gagged, right? So they can't say anything. They're like, "We're up here, you idiot!" He's like singing, yeah. right? And they start swinging back and forth. They're like wriggling their bodies to swing back and forth. And somehow, yeah, somehow there's a rope. Batman catches it with his foot, and they use it to whip off Alfred's hat. <laughs> He's like, "What's oh going my on?" Gosh, he's That's like, "Where did so we go? What's happening?" Yeah, <laughs> it is ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and at that very moment, Manuel and his thugs are entering uh, uh, an apartment in an exclusive uh, neighborhood. Right, so they're going after Mister Leduc. So Leduc is the bad guy, right? So Leduc. No, 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 and... no. Manuel's the oh. bad guy. Leduc is the the man that Alfred befriended oh. on the boat. He's the Duke. He's the one that's running from the Got Nazis. It. All right, right, I'm with you now. Sorry. And, and he's the one that has the bag with all the, the gold in it. I think the gist is maybe they mistook Alfred for the Duke. Like they knew that the Duke was running. They were like they were related, but they were actually just friends or something. I don't so, know. Yeah. So yeah, so this the this set of bad guys, Manuel, goes into to, ca- catches the Duke asleep. Yes. And then is Leduc's stealing the Duke. his I just bag. That. <laughs> Sorry. And uh it might even be a french duke and <laughs> kidnaps him and they right. go back to the theater and so th- so manuel and his goons are dragging leduc in the theater and manuel's being funny he's like ah batman i see you've waited for me yeah still tied up somehow uh alfred hasn't gotten him down yet oh but they're actually not tied up they're just hanging and so they swing down from the rafters they start beating up the goons because alfred mm-hmm. untied them they punch him in the face Thank goodness Alfred was there to save their bacon. They've, uh, yeah, they've knocked out the dudes. Batman, so these are what they were after. He opens the bag and it's... It's the Duke's bag, right? They've got the him Duke's confused. Bag, yeah. I'm sorry. I've mm-hmm. never biffed telling a story so bad. The goons, Manuel and his crew. Save it in the edit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> the goons, Manuel and his, and, his, and his crew, think that Alfred is the Duke that's yeah. running away. Uh, it's not, it's Alfred. And so they get it mixed up. That's why they're going after him. And that's why they weren't surprised to find Alfred in a big mansion. Yes, exactly. It's all, yeah. it's all coming together. Yeah. Later, they find the real Duke. They get his bag. They bring it back to the hideout where Batman and Robin are waiting because Alfred's freed them. That's what's mm-hmm. happened. And Leduc turns to Alfred. My friend, you have saved my life and my country's treasures. <laughs> and to think I laughed when you said you were an amateur detective. <laughs> and Robin's got a little thought balloon, he says, and he wasn't the only one who left. <laughs> and there, we're back at Wayne Manor. We're cutting to later. It says the following evening. And Bruce says, Alfred's pretty proud since we gave him full credit for this case. I really thought he'd mm-hmm. done a great job of detecting. He's in the newspaper. Yeah. Until it turned out that he got all his information by accident. And Dick says, for a while, I was afraid he'd find out who we really are. But if we're careful, it will be safe to let him stay since he isn't too bright. And at that moment, Alfred walks in and he's got the costumes. Beg pardon, sirs. You'll be going out directly, and I thought I might assist you with your uniforms. Bruce and Dick, like, turn quickly, like, what the heck? What are you talking about? And- how, how, what? What? Uh-huh. And uh, Alfred opens the windows, and it's the best signal. He goes, ah, oh, the searchlight went on a few seconds ago, and I believe yeah. that means you guys are needed. Yeah, they're like, oh, you figured it out. Maybe you aren't such a bad detective, right? They don't know that he figured this out by accident, yeah, too. Yeah, by accident, yeah. And, and they're like, uh, you know, I guess you can stay. You can be our help. And he says, you know, you're one of us now, Alfred. I hope you realize that if you this knowledge leaked out, Robin's life and mine would be forfeit. Criminals would have an easier time of it. And I mean, they saved his life because what we have established in the issues over and over again is when anyone finds out Batman and Robin's true identity, they die very quickly <laughs> after this. Yeah. And so by letting him stay, they've saved his life. We haven't seen the last of him, it says. That's it. So what do you think? The, our first two Alfred stories... What do you think about this character and how he's how he's different than the Alfred you know and love? I mean, it's fun. I I I, I mean, he's obviously not a badass like the Alfreds that we know from the cinema. But like, I think this is a, a fun portrayal, and it it makes it, it kind of brings a little bit of that like sta- slapstick or like the Three Stooges kind of humor into this, where it's just like tripping over himself and manages to have good things happen. Um, so there's there's certainly like a humor to it. Um, I don't mind it, but I think 
the Alfred that we know is better. There's definitely an evolution here, which leads me into the inspiration. I think this is super fascinating because if you Google like Alfred inspiration, right? Uh, or, you know, B Bill Finger, Alfred quote, Bob Kane, Alfred quote, 1940s Alfred, you know, you will not find tons and tons of people talking about where does Alfred come from? And if you think about it, right, this is a pretty common trope now. The British butler is absolutely a thing that you see in over and over. In more recent pop culture, you've got Woodhouse in Archer, you've got Zazu in The Lion King, you've got Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. you've got Wadsworth in Clue. In addition to the British butler trope, you've also got the battle butler trope, right, which is like Kato from the Pink Panther or Kato from the Green Hornet, same name. <laughs> oh, sure. You've got Oddjob and Goldfinger. Yeah. Um, you've got Wong, Doctor Strange. You've got the concierge and John Wick, right? The battle oh, butler. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This trope of the battle butler is actually really, really, really huge in anime and manga right now. You've got a whole series called Black, but Black Butler, where he's basically just this trope. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's the whole book, right? And all of that is coming back to this time ish early early 20th century early 1900s right um so i think alfred is an important part of the formation of this trope but he's definitely not the beginning so like i'm trying to say okay what came before because there's tons and tons and tons of examples of things that came after uh but what comes before uh the biggest one i can i can find or the the best one i think that i can find is jeeves are you familiar with jeeves as a character ask ask jeeves.com ask jeeves.com yeah yeah do you know anything about jeeves besides it's a butler from ask jeeves no it's a nothing. search engine Okay. No, I, I know it is it is a reference. I think it's it's an older reference because if I ever drive my in-laws around, they make they say, Jeeves, do this, Jeeves, do that. Like, Jeeves, turn left. <laughs> so, funny. yeah, Jeeves is a character from a series of comedy novels and short stories written by a man named P.G. Woodhouse, spelled W-O-D-E, Woodhouse, um, which, if you remember, Archer, the butler's name is Woodhouse, right? So, oh, right. reference back, yep. Got it. Those novels and short stories ran all the way from 1950 to the 1970s. So Woodhouse is active writing these books that whole time. Very popular, very famous. Jeeves, as a character, his deal is that he's the valet for a rich, young, idle man named Bertie Wooster. So uh, valet is kind of like butler, but it's like more like manservant. Right. I think valet yeah, actually has comes from the French manservant. Right. Yeah. So the, my my familiarity, probably the modern familiarity would be the the valet in um, Downton Abbey. Yes. And how mm -hmm. he's the dude who who helped the I don't know if was he the Duke. I don't remember what the guy's sure. title was, but he helped helped dress him, made sure that he was comfortable wherever he was going, set up his cars. Yes. Et cetera. Yeah. Serves them food, chooses out outfits, mm -hmm. gets them clean, like draws their bath, so, takes the so you, jackets off of people when they come in the door, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So you might, so like a very wealthy person might like have a staff of people mm -hmm. and the valet is like the, the most important one. It's the personal attendant. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And Bertie Wooster, the man he's the valet for is rich and idle. So the idea is that like, he has no job. He has no prospect. He has mm -hmm. no relationships. His, he's just kind of enjoying being rich, doing nothing. And he's kind of a hooligan, right? And the running gag of Jeeves and Wooster together is that Jeeves is actually the one in charge, <laughs> right? And Wooster is too dumb to understand or maybe too complacent to complain, right? So he kind of just goes along with everything that, that Jeeves says. So like Jeeves is actually in charge of Wooster's life. Um, he makes the decisions. He helps him get out of problems. He like runs the show. Uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jeeves and Wooster are often compared to Sherlock and Watson, where Jeeves nice. is the Sherlock and Wooster is the Watson. So right, basically you have this very interesting character, interesting. Jeeves, right? Yeah. You'd think in the story about the rich, you know, no nobility yeah. in, in the early 1900s, right? The point of view character would be Wooster, but it's not. Jeeves is. <clears throat> And mm. Wooster specifically is there just to be a point of view. He's uh, viewing Jeeves kind of being in charge of being smart and like running the show. So in 1990, it was adapted by the BBC into a sitcom where Hugh Laurie is Wooster. Amazing. And Stephen Fry is Jeeves. It ran for three years. I, this probably is an awesome show. I watched both the first of these episode. These are awesome. It's fantastic. Oh, gosh. I'm Okay, I gotta look these up then. Ali's yeah. gonna love it. Very, very dry humor. Very, like, very silly. You know, they're getting into antics. Wooster Hugh Laurie is, like, mm -hmm. being just the... He, the you know, he, he, there's this running gag throughout the episode about how he thinks it's hilarious to go up to policemen and steal their hats. 
And that's just the thing he does. And he explains it to people like it's the most normal thing. And they're like, what are you talking about? You're crazy. And he doesn't understand, you know? Yeah. And th- the gag is that like, he's trying to help his buddy tell this woman that um, he's interested in her. And accidentally, mm-hmm. because he's dumb, sort of conveys that he wants to to get with her, right? But he doesn't want to. And so he ends up in this social predicament where she thinks that they're going to get engaged, right? They're going to be married. Like, and he does all these things to help his friend impress the woman. So like, there's this child that he doesn't like, that's a family member that he like pushes into the lake and the friend's supposed to come and save the kid and, and be, you know, like <laughs> he the, drowns the kid. No, he doesn't drown the kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but like the guy doesn't show up. And so he has to oh die, jump gosh. in and g- get the kid out. So he, he like creates the problem, solves the problem, ends up being, you know, so Wooster's like this bumbling idiot, can't do anything right. And Jeeves like gets him out of the pickle because he doesn't want to be in the relationship with this girl. And so Jeeves like oh, oh, orchestrates this thing. It's very good, right? That's super funny. Yeah. So Jeeves and Alfred both coming about, about at the beginning of the 20th century. Jeeves does come first by like 10, 20 years, right? But they're really the ones that are together at this time, cementing the, the British Butler trope, right? Probably Jeeves more than Alfred, but he's part of it. Like it's in the water. It, it is a little bit of an evolution of a trope from the 19th century and before of just the the valet, right? The, the you know, from French manservant. Another example that happens um, in 1872 is from Around the World in 80 Days by Jules, Jules, mm. Jules Verne. The, the sort of ride along character in that is a guy named Pasparato, which is like a wordplay on passport because they're going around the world. <laughs> He's the valet to uh, Phileas Fogg, who's the main character. And, you know, they go and they see the world, reads like a fictional travel log. Um, passport Toe has a lot of these things as well, right? He's sort of the cunning, smart, interesting, you know, character. It's it's a paradox, right? We're not, you wouldn't think of the butler as the interesting guy, but but he is, right? I should also mention, if you, if you call back to the Dr. Connery episode, um, mm-hmm. We had a bonus episode that this got cut from the, the main episode because we had an hour long conversation with her. She Which brought up awesome. the mysteries novels. It was really good. You should go back and listen to it. Yeah, it's great. She spoke about an 1842 French novel called The Mysteries of Paris that included a wealthy crime fighter named Rudolph who had a trusty Scottish valet. So he's kind of the sidekick before the pre Robin sidekick is is the is the manservant that, that's like the one pulling the strings behind the scene, making it all happen. And that got cribbed a bunch of times. There's like Mysteries of New York. Mysteries of London, so on, a bunch of like variations on this that all have that trope. Right. Yes, I remember her talking about that set of books, The Mysteries of Paris, Mysteries of London. Yeah. So it comes comes from a lineage of like, you know, manservants or like valets or whatever. But uh, I yeah. think Jeeves is the closest relative for sure. One last thing that I think okay. I have to mention, because if I don't, that people people will say something about it. Did you know that Batman has a meaning outside of the character, the word Batman? No. <laughs> so So Batman is actually a British English term that predates the character by a significant margin. And it refers like, like to... Like you would call someone a Batman? Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. It refers to an important... Uh, so someone who would be assigned to an important military officer, a, a personal service, they would be called a Batman or Pac-Man because bat is another word for for pack, right? So obsolete turn for a pack saddle that you would have on a horse called a bat, right? So you, you might call at that time a pack horse, a bat horse, right? Huh. Um, so the Batman is the person that is tending to the horse to the military officer that's on the field. They might have all kinds of jobs like tending to the horse, driving a vehicle, maintaining the uniform, digging a foxhole. It's a military officer's valet, right? The officer's bat- body man on the on the field. And so that's why sometimes, especially in the golden age, you might see Alfred described as Batman's Batman. Batman's Batman. Yes, oh, Alfred is Batman's Batman. Yes. Huh. Yeah, without that background, I would interpret that entirely differently. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's it's a wordplay that is totally lost on us today because like Yeah. World War One, right? Like, when was the last time military officers are riding on a horse? Totally outdated. Probably all the time in Britain today. And sure, <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean, like, if someone said like they're like they're like a real man's man, yeah, sure. like, that means something completely different than <laughs> like that. That's a that's a Batman's Batman. <laughs> you know, like it it means different things. It's it's pretty interesting, especially with that background. I love it. That's all I had on Alfred. I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't wait to see uh, how Alfred evolves over time because um, you kind of hinted at this, I think, in a previous discussion mm. that they updated Alfred's look to mm-hmm. align with the 66 show because that was an older gentleman. Gentleman. Well, so I don't want to give too much away, but okay. um, there will be more Alfred on next episode because we're coming back to the ah. series. So you remember one of the first appearances of Alfred is in, in fact, the first the written series, appearance right. is from the serials. So... 
put a pin in that. We'll come back to it. Yeah, man. I'm super stoked. I can't wait to see uh, what I learn in the next issue or in the next episode. Hey, Bat Family, if you made it this far, I know you like the episode. So do yourself a favor, subscribe. You won't miss any more videos. Give it a like, leave a comment down below. Tell us what we got wrong. And to keep the Batman history train going, watch this video next.